My name is Alondra Arce. Today is April 12th. My name is Alondra Arce. Today is April 12th. The time is 4.35 p.m. and we are here at the Pewaukee VFW. I'm interviewing Arnold Quaklar, who was born on J July 7th, 1937 in Muskegon, Michigan, and served in the Cold War era between the years 1955 and 1963. Arnold Quaklar was a Spec 4 in the U.S. Army and served as an active Army Reserve. This interview is sponsored by the Bell Tower Memorial. So, hello, Arnold. Hi. How are you today? I'm very a beautiful day. It is a very nice day out. <laughs> so to start off our interview, what were you doing before you entered the service? Well, I was uh, in uh, high school mm -hmm. and um, I was 17 years old. And um, just the time when I was uh, in the draft list as classified A1, which means that I would go into the service any time after I graduated. Yeah. And I thought, you know, what I would really like to do is volunteer. Mm -hmm. um, my uncle, John, was in the military and I really felt I, that I wanted to serve. And so uh, there was, we were in the band. We found out that there were openings in the band and about 12 of us from the band all were graduating and we wanted to uh, serve and go in, and we did. So we all uh, signed up and went in together. Got and it. So I'm, I'm guessing that in high school you were interested in band, the arts, or what were you more like in high school? Well, <clears throat> when I was about eight years old, I started playing a clarinet in mm -hmm. the band. So it was pretty early. And uh, so being in the band all the way through, junior high and high school, uh, being in the marching band. And in fact, in the marching band, I was one of the guard, the, um, in the color guard yeah. with a rifle. It was uh, not a real rifle, but, mm -hmm. uh, but anyway, that was my first touch in really thinking, boy, it'd be great to serve in the military. And to be in the band was just a tremendous honor. Uh, because I knew you had to try out for it and you had to be fairly good. Um, and uh, so we did that as a group. It was the right decision and it was, it was the right time for me. Got it. So during the enlisting process, did you have to audition in the band to be in the Barney Band or what was that like? Yes, we had to. Uh, it was somewhat informal because there were so many of us. Yeah. But we had been in a good band that had won several honors, like in the Tulip Festival in Holland, Michigan, we uh, uh, got a, a one rating, mm -hmm. which is the highest, of course. Yeah. And, and so we just, I felt just the music was in, in my future. Got it. And um, I also sang in the choir and music was a big part of my high school experience. Mm -hmm. So getting into the military was like a dream come true in the band. Yeah, that's great. So what were your early weeks of training like? Like, How did you adapt to that military life? Well, the first uh, basic training was uh, at Camp McCoy here mm -hmm. in Wisconsin. Yeah. Uh, we had to come from Michigan because that's where we were stationed. And, um, it was a, a very typical basic training. You know, we had to crawl on our bellies under the razor wire and all that stuff. We had to learn how to fire a weapon. Mm -hmm. And uh, fortunately, I was very good at that. <laughs> I never shot a, a rifle before in my life, but ended up getting the top rating as an expert marksman, uh, even though marksman's a rating, but this a third level. I was the first level, and that was a great honor. All right. So what kind of music would you perform in, like, basic training? Did you have to perform anything? Yeah, we were, <clears throat> we were playing a lot of um, band music yeah. for marching. 
mm -hmm. because one of the major duties is to march, uh, particularly in the in the reviews where all the troops were uh, part, passing in review, and um, so being able to march and play an instrument and all the things that go along with that um, was a big part of our basic training. But we also had to do uh, had to be able to play any type of music that the troops wanted. Mm -hmm. And the spirit of the Corps was our objective. And to do uh, the music that the guys would enjoy. And, uh, and so we had to play the, the big band music at that time, which was a great uh, valve of me to be mm -hmm. playing jazz. Um, and uh, we had a Dixieland band, mm -hmm. we had a German band, we had a, a quartet mm -hmm. for barbershop music. Yeah. Um, uh, and of course, I mentioned the, the marching band, but we had a concert band also. Mm -hmm. And so uh, any kind of music that um, would entertain the troops, we uh, had to be able to play. Yeah, so when you guys would march, would it be around Michigan? Would it be in Wisconsin? Good question. We we marched in parades a lot. Yeah. Uh, that are that were civic parades. Um, any flag day parade or Memorial Day parade, uh, usually not um, the July Four parade for some mm -hmm. reason. They didn't use an army band, but we were also at the direction of the uh, general of our division that if ever he needed a band to play, uh, we were called to play. And so uh, we had to be ready all the time. In addition to that, we had to be ready for military duty, mm -hmm. uh, which is active reserve in the Army. We had to go through all the basic training for that to be able to be called within 48 hours ready to leave mm -hmm. for an assignment wherever in the world the Army uh, des decided we should go. Got it. Were you trained in any other skills at Camp McCoy? Yes. Uh, I, our secondary duties were military uh, medics. Mm -hmm. We had to be trained in all the medic requirements. And also in landmine warfare, we were the ones that had to locate the mines wherever they were. So mm -hmm. we were trained in doing that. Uh, so obviously the mine wouldn't go off mm -hmm. when we were finding them. And um, there were a few other things we were called on to do uh, that were more um, probably strategic yeah. in uh, gathering information, and so on. But that, those were the primary duties. Got it. Did you ever have to apply any of those skills while in the military? We were never called, but we did get the infamous red letter, mm. which is a letter um, with a red border around it, mm -hmm. which was to get our attention that we had to be ready to leave in 48 hours. Mm -hmm. And it was that we got the, that letter when there was a, a, a conflict in the Middle East and in Palestine specifically. Yeah. And uh, we were being activated to go there. Yeah. And then it, before we had to leave, it was canceled. <laughs> so we never ended up going. Yeah. So I understand, what is this story about the clarinet player that lost his finger? Yeah, that was unfortunate. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the the first chair clarinet player was a good friend of mine. His mm -hmm. name was Joe Kramer. And um, he was leading uh, a platoon on a bivouac exercise. Now, bivouac is field duty in, in the woods, uh, in a field. And um, we were being brought there by a, a deuce and a half, which mm -hmm. is a two and a half ton military vehicle. Mm -hmm. um, and so as we get, got to the point where we were do our, to do our training, um, 
we were jumping off the end of the truck. Yeah. Well, he happened to catch his ring finger on a hook on the truck, and he jumped off, and it took his finger off. Uh, all that was left was just the bone of the finger. It was a horrible thing to see, and it, it happened so fast that um, uh, a friend of mine picked up his finger. We rushed him to the hospital uh, with the idea maybe they could reattach it, but mm -hmm. they couldn't. So he was with a just a, a short finger, <laughs> and for a clarinet player, that's pretty severe. Yeah. And uh, so the military revamped his clarinet to be able to play with one less finger. Uh, he never really was able to play well after that, but that was a, a sad experience. But with, with active duty, would have been a lot worse than that. But uh, that was the one incident that I remember very well. Well, yeah, and as a clar clarinet player myself, like uh -huh. I couldn't imagine playing without my ring finger because it's so essential. Mm -hmm. I know. So props to him for actually going through and practicing and, you know, pushing forward with that. That's amazing. Yeah. yeah. So did you ever work well in the military? Were you ever like... I was uh, very yeah. active in the military. That's mm -hmm. probably one of the reasons why, why I didn't... Uh, do real well in my grades in college. <laughs> but I was very active, of course, in the, in the band, which took a fair amount of time. I was also working as an intern for Johnson Service Company at the time. Um, and I was working 40 hours a week, wow. uh, which was part-time uh, officially, but uh, I just put in a lot of hours. And then with studying, I was dating my lovely wife uh, at that time, and um, I was very active in our church. Mm -hmm. uh, I was also in the engineering society in college, and uh, also in the traveling choir of the college. And so we had tours of, of that as well. Mm -hmm. So I was, I was pretty busy, and um, that carried into my career. Mm -hmm. Because during my career, I very rarely got more than five five hours of sleep at night. Wow. And so uh, I had to stay awake on my toes all the time. Got it. So you were really busy. And yeah. <laughs> I can't imagine right now how <laughs> I'd handle that. Yeah. So were you considered to be one of your greatest, most important contributions during your service? Well, I think the experience of being in the military and the discipline, yeah. uh, learning to be on time <laughs> and be there fully prepared at all times um, was a, a great discipline. But I think beyond that, what was important for me is to be a part of the country. Uh, my desire to serve was not because of any gain that I was to get. I wanted to give and give to my country. Uh, and I was very proud of that. And I learned to respect the flag. Um, when we woke up in the morning, we played the Reveille. Mm -hmm. And so we woke up to be ready uh, as quickly as we could. And it was pretty demanding at that. And then go to bed at night playing taps. Mm -hmm. And just the spirit of uh, being in the military and serving was a great experience for me. That's great. So. Did playing, I'm understanding that playing music was a big part of who you are and your identity, especially because you took it over in the military. And do you just continue to play music? Do you think about that? Well, I um, gave my clarinet to one of my grandchildren. Aww. And uh, she played the clarinet in her high school. And I thought that was a great way to retire my, what, what we called our acts mm -hmm. in the military. Um, and uh, she did well. Uh, I really got into more of the music uh, with singing. Yeah. I organized probably three or four different barbershop quartets, but we sang gospel music. Mm -hmm. And we used to give a lot of concerts in churches and, and so on. And uh, that was a great experience. Amazing. So what was it like transitioning 
from military life to civilian life? Well, the two were often integrated together mm -hmm. uh, because I was doing so much in the, in the yeah. community as well as in the military. Um, that adjustment was fairly easily easy mm -hmm. for me. I was so busy uh, just keep keeping a schedule and keeping on schedule. Uh, that adjustment really didn't seem to be an adjustment. Uh, I just did all the things I had to do on my list and uh, enjoyed doing it. Got it. So when you married your beautiful girlfriend, <laughs> which was yes. at the time was your girlfriend, but now is your beautiful wife. Yes. Where did you guys settle in the state? Did you guys settle in Michigan or Wisconsin? We uh, settled in, even though I was born in Muskegon, yeah. uh, my parents moved to Grand Rapids when I was about three years old. Mm -hmm. uh, so I never really knew Muskegon. But Grand Rapids is where we settled down. Mm -hmm. And uh, my job with Johnson Service Company, which is now Johnson Controls, was located in Grand Rapids. So all of our lives were really there. Norma was from the uh, the west side of Grand Rapids. I was from the south side. So we didn't live in the same neighborhood, but we went to the same high school. Mm -hmm. um, but that, uh, that uh, location was great, where we started our family with five sons, uh, four of them born in in Michigan. Mm -hmm. One was born here in Wisconsin. That's great. So did you stay with any of your military, like in touch with any of your military friends after the military service? Yes, I did. We, I had one relatively co close friend. Uh, he and I were at Kelvin College together. Mm -hmm. uh, Boyd Pasteur was his name and he married a very lovely girl. And Norma and I would go and visit them quite frequently. They moved to Florida. <laughs> that was a great place to go in the summer. It is. So uh, when we had time, we we went there. Florida sounds like a great vacation, yeah. you know? especially <laughs> with the Wisconsin like weather. Yes. Yes. It's yes. crazy and unpredictable. And he also played the clarinet. And then the challenge that we had, um, I should just mention, is playing a clarinet was the primary duty, but I had to have a second instrument oh. and that was the berry sax mm -hmm. i understand you play the berry sax yes also. i play the berry sax so, my secondary and the big well. band sound was really in mm. and uh that was really a great thrill that's great do you prefer your clarinet or your berry sax i prefer the clarinet i really grew up with that mm -hmm. and uh and i just felt at home and ended up in the all all city orchestra for a short time, and uh, so that was just where my instrument was. Got it. So going back to how you work, and is it an engineering academy or? Well, Kelvin College is a liberal arts college. Liberal arts college. And I entered their pre-engineering program mm -hmm. with the idea that I would spend three years at Kelvin and two years at a state university. Yeah. And I had picked uh, Michigan State in, in Lansing, Michigan. Mm -hmm. uh, however, uh, I finished three years with majors in engineering physics and math and um, decided that I should stay in Grand Rapids with Norma yeah. and not go to Lansing. And so I changed my course to uh, the liberal arts but a Bachelor of Science degree with an engineering major and um, in math. Mm -hmm. And so that fit well into my internship that was with Johnson Controls. Mm -hmm. And uh, they told me that if I was ever to go anywhere in my career with Johnson, I would have to get an engineering degree. Yeah. Well, I got as close to that as I could, <laughs> but ended up as a technician and, and the, I was then hired as the first application engineer mm -hmm. in Johnson Controls. All the engineers there were in sales, mm -hmm. but I was in the technical end of things. Mm -hmm. And so 
uh, I was uh, hired as an application engineer. And uh, from there, uh, went through the, the uh, branch office uh, situation in Grand Rapids, but then was promoted to headquarters in, Grand, in Milwaukee um, as the, the head of the central engineering uh, department there. And so all my busyness uh, ended up being national sure. rather than local. And uh, it was a great experience. That's amazing. So can you tell me more about this photo you have in your hand? Yeah, I thought I'd take this just to prove that I was in an <laughs> army band. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we didn't have a lot of pictures taken of us mm -hmm. uh, other than probably in a parade maybe. But um, this picture shows me, I think I was the tallest guy yeah. in, in the band. And I'm on the back row, and anytime we had pictures taken, I always had to stand in the back row because mm -hmm. I was the tallest. But uh, I'm in there, I think, right there. Yep. Um, and uh, it was a good camaraderie, you might say, in that the, the band really was a close knit organization, and we respected each other greatly, and we had varied skills and I know a couple of the band were in jazz in big mm -hmm. time and so in our barracks uh, we heard music all the time and much of that was with the jazz players and they just play all day and all night and one in particular his name was Gay Whitney mm -hmm. he was very professional and was a composer of jazz music mm -hmm. and he'd play the piano sing and write music all the time. Uh, the problem was to stay awake, he'd drink. Uh -huh. And he always had a bottle of whiskey next to him. Uh -huh. And um, he'd write music until he passed out. And uh, usually it was a couple of us guys in the band had to take care of him <laughs> yeah. uh, in many ways. And um, he only lived to the age of 33, mm -hmm. which was sad. He's a very intelligent, uh, gifted musician. Mm -hmm. But uh, anyway, that's our story about the band. Yeah, can you see that? There we go. Got it. Here OK. Go. And then I also understand that you're an author. Can you tell me about that? Well, that's interesting. I, I thought I'd uh, take proof of being an author. <laughs> so I, I took my book along. Mm -hmm. uh, I was very fortunate to uh, work for 27 and a half years with Johnson Controls. Yeah. And I was a, a national manager of um, engineering there. And then also, I headed up the Johnson Controls Institute yeah. as uh, the, their training wow. arm of the corporation. And uh, so um, from there, I was selected by the, um, f the federal government to, um, to head up uh, international standards for the International Standards Organ Organization. Mm -hmm. And then I started two ministries in the central city of, of Milwaukee. Mm -hmm. And because of all the things that uh, God led me to do and enabled me to do, I wrote my story in a book. And uh, it was after I retired that I had the time to do to this. It, yeah. and, um, and so I finished this in 2020. Mm -hmm. Just, and it was introduced and released. Uh, in December of tw uh, 2019. Mm -hmm. So it was January of 2020 when COVID hit mm -hmm. yeah. and the book was never really introduced. Oh. And so even though it's listed on Amazon.com and, uh, and Barnes and Noble and so on mm -hmm. as an author, which is an honor to be chosen yeah. as an author. But uh, the book is called Doing God's Work with uh, brothers and sisters in Christ serving in Milwaukee. And it was really an organization set up to encourage 
people in churches to volunteer and work cross-culturally mm -hmm. between the urban and suburban communities. And uh, I just felt that it would be good for young people or old people to know mm -hmm. what it's like to work in a cross-cultural setting. Mm -hmm. And so that's what this book is all, all about. Yeah, I will be purchasing that book. I will <laughs> okay. be taking a read. Because okay, well, I think it's yeah. very interesting how you took the time, apart from your busy life, to sit down and think about all, all your experiences, your current experiences, and put them in a book. I think that's really great. Yeah. So going back to that picture, where did you guys travel like as oh, a band? Um, <clears throat> we traveled throughout Michigan. Yeah. Um, Detroit, Lansing, uh, Pontiac, uh, the, the cherry festivals in Traverse City was something we did every year. Uh, Camp McCoy, of course, was in Wisconsin. And uh, we did some concerts in that area around uh, Camp McCoy. It's now called Fort McCoy. Uh, but uh, that's we went wherever there was an opportunity to serve. Uh, and the big activity was on Saturday mornings in camp mm -hmm. uh, where there were over 10,000 troops and men in the various units that were there in training and we'd have to play on Saturday morning from 8 in the morning until 1 o'clock in the afternoon and we had to stand there that whole time oh. playing music almost all the time mm -hmm. and then we had a troop uh, march at the end at the beginning of all the troops marching in review yeah and uh, that's pretty demanding and uh, that's when I think I started having problems with my my back <laughs> <laughs> because I still have problems standing uh, and having pain but um, it was a great experience mm -hmm. and uh, one of the things that our band did that we were known for is doing strange things in mm. strange places and in strange ways. Uh, and I remember one time um, our, our sergeant and uh, commanding officer decided to play When the Saints Go Marching In. Mm. And when we passed the reviewing stand, all of us were to swagger. And uh, that got a lot of attention. And uh, we all had fun with mm. it in a very military strict environment mm -hmm. uh, we sort of broke the rules and and did that <laughs> that's so funny so relating to my high school um i want to join the marching band would you recommend uh, me joining the marching band currently right now oh i think it's a marvelous experience yeah. you learn the choreography of formations mm -hmm. you learn the discipline of of everyone doing everything uh, supposed to do at the precise same time yeah. and I see these marching bands today in university level they're huge they're bands huge. Yeah. and they do a marvelous job and uh, uh, and something that uh, I saw in one of the marching bands they had uh, a, a, a way between songs that mm -hmm. they were marching to yeah. they'd all play a note of the scale and it was a unique sound i've right. never heard before have you ever seen that yes but i've gone it's to many. amazing mm -hmm. and uh, so that marching experience is so much better now than it was when i was doing <laughs> you know we had pretty simple things to do but if you can get into a marching band it's a great experience mm -hmm. um, but also not ignoring all the other types of music. Yeah. You know, I think that's one of the things the Army Band taught me is to appreciate all kinds of music. All right, so relating to that, what are some life lessons that you learned in the military? Well, I mentioned uh, the discipline. Yeah. I think uh, also staying awake almost all the time <laughs> uh, was a real challenge. Uh, but I really appreciated the spirit of patriotism you know when i joined i wanted to serve and i was talking to a, a fellow veteran just today at where i'm living mm -hmm. and he said you know 
when he joined too, it wasn't for any personal gain um, or money. Uh, you don't get rich mm -hmm. in the military. It was a sense of serving and to serve a country, uh, particularly today, mm -hmm. um, where so many people don't have that spirit, it seems. And uh, I would be a firm believer in, in having a, a one to two year service requirement for every <laughs> young person because you learn so much about camaraderie, uh, working together and respecting each other and respect, respecting the flag. Mm -hmm. Because we learned that every time you passed a flag, you had to salute. Mm -hmm. And every time you saw an officer, passed an officer, you said, sir. And that's, that respect and mm -hmm. discipline was so valuable for me. And uh, we were very fortunate with our our sons mm -hmm. that two of the five have been in the military yeah. and uh, and we're just very proud of them both have been doing very well in the military and um, we also now have a great have a grandson mm -hmm. that's in the military and in training to be a pilot in the Air Force oh, so we're really proud of that and just would love to see that continue no oh, yeah um I'm so interested in the military. I think mm. it might be my plan after mm. high school. It's one of my options. Great. Because I admire how they teach discipline, how they yeah. teach respect. Yeah. I really admire the reasons that, you know, to go. Because yeah. I don't want to go for personal gain. Yeah. I, I want to be the first person in my family to serve. And I would Wonderful. be the first person to, in my family to serve. Right. Um, I think becoming a mechanic in the Air Force would be like, very <laughs> exciting for me oh, and maybe joining great. the band to just to add on to it because i enjoy doing music just as much as you do yeah. and i really enjoy like getting your perspective on how you see the young modern like population now yeah. and how they should join in yeah. and just tune in and really think about the reasons they're joining the military well, that's wonderful mm -hmm. i think that's a, a very admirable uh, attitude Thank to you. take and I believe that your attitude will determine your altitude in life. So <laughs> thank you that's so great. much. So, um, do you have any regrets during the military? I'm guessing not because I you don't have any. Uh, I can't think of one thing that would have been detrimental. Mm -hmm. It was all very positive. The, the the sad thing is that the band ended up being moved from Grand Rapids to Detroit oh. <laughs> uh, the last uh, year and a half mm -hmm. of my required time. So I had to transfer to a different band, which fortunately was in Grand Rapids. That was the National Guard band. Mm -hmm. So I served in the National Guard as well for a short time. Did your friends? That's my only regret. Oh, OK. <laughs> Did your friends like follow you to that Detroit mission? Yes. Or? most No, not to no? Detroit. None of them went to Detroit. They oh. all went to the National Guard, the National Guard or just dropped out of the army, military. Got it. And I wanted to finish my time, so I stayed there. So most of you guys stuck together. Yes. Is that something that you also learned in the military, uh, like uh, connecting with other people, joining in, like brotherhood? Is that a oh yeah, that that brotherhood loyalty. Mm -hmm. um, we really uh, had a very very close knit unit. Yeah. And even though I know um, when we went out for concerts uh, at, in a community concert, uh, the guys loved to celebrate afterwards. Mm -hmm. And they all went to the bars, not all of them, most <laughs> of them. Yeah. Um, but we were from uh, the group of 12 that ended up in the band, were from a Christian background. Yeah. And we just didn't <laughs> drink like that. Mm -hmm. But we ended up, uh, I particularly ended up being responsible to make sure all the soldiers got back to okay. the barracks. <laughs> and that was not always easy. <laughs> and uh, But I learned a lot with that, mm -hmm. you know, just to take care of each other. And even though things weren't always perfect, um, we really did take care of each other. And that's a brotherhood that you learn to 
appreciate mm -hmm. and, um, and, and really enjoy. I think the connections we create with people are very valuable. Yes. So it's nice to know that the military is like almost like a hotspot for people to connect, to talk of different backgrounds from different places. Yeah. And it's nice how yeah. we're all the same under one flag when yes. the military in this country. So that's very And that's nice. really important. Yes. And I think that's something I, America needs mm -hmm. is to return to that attitude that will raise our altitude in, in, uh, the, in the country. I won't say make America great again, it's too political. <laughs> but, uh, but it's really something America needs. Mm -hmm. Got and it. I have the flag that you're standing in front, sitting in front of, but that's so important, I think, to anybody that served in the military, mm -hmm. to see a casket come back draped in a flag is very meaningful. Yeah. And to play the taps, uh, we had guys in the in the band that played taps like you've never heard it mm -hmm. because there was so much emotion filled with that. It's so giving the ultimate sacrifice mm -hmm. is something we deeply respect. It's amazing, yeah, I can imagine people communicate their emotions through music and yeah. the way you play stuff really yeah. shows what you're trying to show other people. Yes. Like <clears throat> certain songs just need th that certain emotion. Yeah. And I think that playing taps is very meaningful. Yeah. I always tear up when I hear it. It's, yeah. it's a very emotional song, yes. even if I'm it not is. the one affected. So. Yeah. yeah. And, and that, even when uh, President Kennedy yeah. was assassinated, I'll always remember the drum beat to marching with his casket down, down the streets of Washington, D.C. There's a unique drum beat to that that really, in me, arouses that passion to remember mm -hmm. how important it is uh, for the men, millions of men that have served, and uh, not every one of them made it, mm -hmm. and they gave up their their lives for the country. Did you watch the casket get, like the tap song? Did you listen to it live, or did you listen to it? Oh, over? I was on TV. You were watching yeah. it on TV. Yeah. yeah, I've been in Washington many times mm -hmm. in in the Capitol, but. Uh, not for that ceremony. Yeah. yeah, that's tough. All right, thank you so yeah. much for that. Well, I am honored to be able to talk about that. And I don't have a chance to talk about my military service because mm -hmm. there's so many other things that I did, even in the book. I didn't <laughs> yeah. talk about the military mm -hmm. in the book, mm -hmm. but uh, how I believe God has given me an opportunity to serve uh, disadvantaged people in urban settings. Uh, yeah. Very few people have an opportunity to do that. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it's just a, a great testimony to life mm -hmm. and liberty and the pursuit of happiness. <laughs> yes. You've heard of that. Oh. <clears throat> huh? Okay. Right. Very good. Well, thank you so much for the opportunity mm -hmm. to tell my story, and uh, I uh, applaud your project. Thank you so it's much. a very interesting project, and particularly using young people like yourself mm -hmm. to uh, write the stories, and uh, you did a great job on that, and I appreciate it. Thank you. I admire veterans like you who take their time out of the day to participate in these, like, yeah. uh, events and activities. Yeah. I owe it all to Mr. Murgis for setting this all up and allowing me this opportunity to meet you because yeah. I'm wonderful. so grateful I got to meet you yeah. and witness your story and listen to you. Uh, so. That's great. Thank mm -hmm. you so much. Thank you. In closing, this has been an interview of Arnold Quakelar regarding his service during the Cold War era. My name is Alondra Arce. The time is 5.15. Thank you for agreeing to this interview and most importantly, 
Thank you for your service. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank we'll have so to much. keep in touch. Yes, of course. Yeah. Uh, give you the encouragement that maybe I can help. Good.